may I be honest with you, since Tuesday night, which was the completion of the primary season for the presidential race coming up in November, and especially with the closing of the polls in California, and now that we have our two presumptive presidential nominees, I have been in a state of despair. As my dear bride will tell you, I have been moping around. I am concerned for the future of our country. I never do want to get political with you, and so I'm not going to endorse a candidate. I'm not sure who I would endorse, which is part of the problem. So as I think about this country that we all dearly love and the future of our country and the legacy that we're going to leave our children and grandchildren, I have been in a state of despair for the future of the country and the future of the world. This passage tonight speaks directly to that. In the, in the sovereign grace of our God, he brought along from my troubled heart anyway, the perfect passage. And I hope it will be for you as well. Because the malaise has lifted, I have been able to recalibrate my spiritual compass and orient myself accordingly as the election approaches and what promises to be the dirtiest and ugliest presidential campaign probably in the history of our country. But this passage brings me great comfort. Now, as I read it to you, you won't find any comfort in it. You'll wonder where in the world do I derive comfort from what I'm about to read. Matthew 21, I'm going to read verses 18 to 22 in the New King James Version. But trust me, it's there, and I'll show it to you in mere moments, all right? So, Matthew chapter 21, verses 18 to 22. Now, in the morning... That is Tuesday morning of Jesus last week. In the morning, as he returned to the city, that is the city of Jerusalem, he was hungry, the he being Jesus, was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. And said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, how did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, this is a passage about assurance, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but if you also say to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer believing, you will receive. Okay, let's pray together, and we have a lot to talk about. Thank you, Father, for bringing us together tonight for this home that has been graciously opened up to us for the reason that we are celebrating tonight. Thank you for Carlton and Arlene, for Kurt and Sue, and the, the tremendous legacy they are leaving after 50 years of faithful marriage. What an example they are, and what a rarity, sadly, in our day. But we thank you for them. We ask your blessing now on our few moments together as we talk about this very important passage, and we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And you may be seated. Jesus assured his disciples, whatever things you ask in prayer believing, you will receive. The irony of that verse is so thick and I don't mean to be cliched here, but you could cut it with a proverbial knife. The irony in this passage, the irony being this. Jesus said those words to his disciples on the eve of his crucifixion in order to strengthen their faith and in order to fortify their fragile faith and, frankly, to strengthen and fortify our own. Jesus knew that the events in their lives were about to spin completely out of control, he knew that their hopes that they harbored in their hearts were about to be crushed on an ash heap of history. He knew that the Jesus movement in which they played a central role was about to careen into a wall and explode into a thousand pieces. The wave that they had been riding had peaked on Sunday during the triumphal entry. It peaked again on Monday during the cleansing of the temple. But Jesus knew only too well on this Tuesday morning that by Thursday night, that same storm surge would dash them to the jagged rocks of reality. They were in for a really tough week. And so to bolster their soon-to-be faltering faith and ours, he made to them and to us 
what is a glorious promise. The promise being, whatever things you ask in prayer believing, you will receive. But there is a problem with that promise. And the problem with that promise, and the reason it is so ironic, a promise given to bolster our faith, the problem is, as many of us in this backyard have discovered during our own personal crises of faith, that promise doesn't always work, does it? Because if it did work, whatever things you ask in prayer believing you will receive, if that did work, none of our loved ones would ever die. Because who of us in this yard haven't prayed to God for someone in faith believing to invoke Jesus' formula to heal someone near and dear to us only to watch them over time wither away to nothing. If this promise always worked, our kids would never disappoint us, would they? Because if that promise worked, what parent hasn't prayed diligently for their children in faith believing, amen, only to have to stand by and watch helplessly and sometimes hopelessly as our kids go sideways. If that promise did indeed work, we would always get the jobs we want. We would always have perfect marriages. We would always have enough money at the end of each month. If that promise really worked, whatever things you ask in prayer believing you will receive. And the fact is, myriads of books have been written and purchased about that very verse. In fact, I went to Amazon.com just yesterday out of curiosity, and I stopped counting, okay? I stopped counting literally at 30 book titles, each of which contained the three words, faith, mountain, prayer. Faith, mountain, prayer. The thesis of each book is how we can move the mountains in our lives if we pray according to the contents of that book. I stopped counting at 30 of them. And how many sermons have been preached on this passage? I mean, it does preach really well, right? That if we do have enough faith, and if we do believe, and if we do not doubt, then God will move all of the mountains in our lives. I mean, I, you know, you can go off on that one, right? You can name the mountains, the mountain of sickness, the mountain of death, the mountain of broken relationships. Over the years, I have heard it all, I have read it all a thousand times. Trust me, every conceivable contribution that can be made taking that verse to assure us that if we pray right, believe right, don't doubt right, God can move any mountain in our lives, I have heard it over and over and over again. But I'm sick of hearing about it because the fact is, it just doesn't work. Or does it? Or does it? Jesus... I have to admit, did give every author, every preacher, every Bible teacher who teaches and waxes eloquent on this verse, Jesus did give them all an out. But it's a very uncomfortable out. Listen to it again as I read it to you and see if you can find the out. Jesus said, assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith, ah, there's an out, and do not doubt, ah, there's an out. You will say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, ah, an out, three outs, you will receive. So there you go. If you pray and don't receive, what's the problem? You doubted. You didn't have enough faith. God didn't fail because God can't fail. So you failed. I failed. I've heard that preached many times as well. You and I failed to pray with enough faith believing. And if you had a smidgen of doubt, no wonder God didn't answer your prayer. And so now, not only did your precious loved one die, now is your fault. Now you not only have to mourn your terrible loss, but while mourning that loss, you and I have to shoulder the burden of guilt, overwhelming guilt, enormously crushing guilt, because if we had had enough faith, if we didn't doubt, they wouldn't have died, or I would have gotten the job, or we would have had enough money to pay the bills, or whatever mountain 
you and I tried to move. And so the irony is that the words that Jesus gave to fortify the fragile faith of his followers, both then and now, only in reality contributed to the failing of the faith of far too many people, maybe even at times yours and mine. Because we dared to take Jesus at his word at a time when our faith was the most vulnerable, when we or someone near to us is facing an illness, or we are having conflicts in relationships, or we are overwhelmingly in debt. We tried to move the mountain, and the mountain didn't move. I love what one of those titles suggested that I found on Amazon, and that is this. You and I can't move mountains. Only God can, but we can move God to move the mountain. Don't you love that? So, all of that being the case, let's get to the good news. What's going on here? What am I missing? What did the disciples hear that you and I might miss? And how did they understand Jesus' words in a way that you and I might not understand them? I love this for a couple of reasons, not just because we get to teach the passage and consider it together, and it has a wonderful truth to it, as you'll see at the end, But also, in terms of the process of your own Bible study and understanding the Bible for yourself, this is a classic example. I mean classic example of what happens when you and I take a verse, rip it completely out of its context, and try to understand it without considering the context of the verse textually. That is, where does it appear in the Gospel of Matthew? The context linguistically, what do the individual words in the original language actually mean? When we fail to understand it historically, what was going on during and after Jesus gave this verse, and understanding it, as you'll see tonight, this goes right to the heart of it, geographically. It's all about location in this case and understanding that. So for the remainder of tonight's discussion, I want to just simply walk you through the passage. I'll allow it to open itself up to you in all of its crystal clarity and its overwhelming encouragement as we do consider the context. All of the above. Textual, linguistic, historical, geographical. Let's put it all together. And I got to tell you, as I said at the very beginning, these words of Jesus are coming none too soon, at least certainly not for me, this week and where we are as a country. So if you are looking at the state of our country and the world today and feeling any semblance of discomfort about where we are or where we're going, this is not only just for me, but this is for you. So let's go through the passage together. I'll just walk you through it. Matthew 21, 18 to 22, as I read it to you in the New King James Version. Now in the morning, let me remind you again, that was Tuesday morning. So we are now to Tuesday morning of Jesus' last and final week. The day before, Jesus had cleansed the temple. In doing so, he had categorically condemned the religious leaders. He essentially put them out of business, along with their unconscionable corruptions of what had become in his day. I'll call it, for want of a better phrase, it certainly describes it. It had become a temple industrial complex. There were a select group of people, oligarchs each, who had commandeered the temple and all of the precious truth that goes with it and used it for their own power and financial gain. We're talking about the high priest and the chief priests who sold out God, sold out his Torah, sold out biblical truth, and sold out their high and holy calling. In fact, this being Tuesday, within 72 hours, by Friday, Jesus would stand before the high priest and be condemned to death by him if you can imagine. So, now it is the very next day after the cleansing of the temple, Tuesday. And according to Matthew, Jesus returned to the city, Jerusalem. And he was hungry, and Matthew writes, and seeing a fig tree by the road. All right, let's pause and talk about that road and talk about that tree. That is the road that led from Bethany on the eastern side of the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem on the western side of the Mount of Olives. As we have established in weeks past, whenever Jesus was in the Jerusalem area, he did not stay in Jerusalem. He stayed with friends who lived in Bethany, the most notable of them, Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus, whom Jesus, as you know, raised from the dead. So every night he would leave the holy city and walk back to Bethany, and then in the morning he would return to Jerusalem Along that road, there's only one 
True then, true now, you can walk that road. I have walked that road, and it's very important that you understand that, that I have walked that road, so I'm not talking to you in any way in a theoretical sense. I've literally been there and have seen the site that I'm about to describe to you. So that's the road between Bethany and Jerusalem, the lay of the land, and in that road in particular, go right to the heart of this story. All right, fig trees. Fig trees. If the palm tree, the palm branch, remember Palm Sunday and them waving the palm branches? If the palm branch was their national flag, and it was, the palm branch was to the people of Jesus' day the equivalent of our American flag. If the palm tree was their flag, the fig tree was their symbol, their national flag symbol. You understand the difference between the two, right? We have a symbol, do we not, in America? What is it? Isn't it the eagle? Yes. Different from our flag. So if the palm tree represents the flag of the land, the fig tree represents the symbol of the land. Why a fig tree of all things? Because of the sweetness of its succulent fruit. Because of the life-giving properties of that fruit, because of the shade of the leaves of that tree, and because of the abundance of fig trees throughout much of the land of Israel, both then and today. So you put all of that together, the sweetness, the life-giving property, the shade, the abundance, and fig trees came to symbolize the nation of Israel, positively and negatively, going all the way back to the beginning of the Bible and the sojourn of God's people in the Holy Land. Positively or negatively, the fig tree, a symbol, depending upon the spiritual conditions of the country. For example, and there are way too many for me to read tonight, I'll just give you a couple to illustrate the point. Hosea, the prophet Hosea, he said this, The Lord said, O Israel, when I first found you, It was like finding fresh grapes in the desert. When I saw your ancestors, God said, it was like seeing the early fruit on the fig tree. The early fruit on the fig tree. Remember that phrase, early fruit. I'll pick it up again. That's the positive. But in the very next verse, this is in Hosea chapter 9, we read the negative. Because at that time, not unlike Jesus' time, the religious leaders had sold out God, the Torah, and the temple. And it had become, in Hosea's day, a temple cult, the temple industrial complex. So the very next verse, God said, but then they deserted me, talking about his people. They deserted me for Baal, giving themselves to that shameful idol, They became as vile as the thing they loved. That's the negative. 1 Kings chapter 4, we read this. During Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel from Dan to Beersheba lived in safety. Everyone under their own vine and under their own fig tree. A symbol of Israel. So much had the fig tree become a symbol of Israel that the king of Assyria was taunting the people of Jerusalem when he said this in Isaiah 36, Do not listen to King Hezekiah. Make peace with me, the Assyrian king said. Come out to me. It was all a lie, but give him credit for trying. Then every one of you will eat from his own vine and fig tree and drink water from his own cistern. Now, that was a lie, but you see his point. A fig tree, a symbol of the nation. Did you know that the fig tree is the very first fruit tree mentioned in the Bible? It's true. It is. Biblically speaking, the fig tree was and is a metaphor used by the biblical writers to depict God's peace and God's blessing on the land when their spiritual condition was good 
and the removal of God's peace and the removal of God's blessing and the removal of God's protection when their spiritual condition was bad. The lack of fruit on a fig tree suggested just the opposite of God's blessing and peace and protection. Listen to what the prophet Joel wrote. Weep like a bride dressed in black, mourning the death of her husband. For there is no grain or wine to offer the temple of the Lord. Our grapevines and fig trees are stripped bare. Only naked branches remain. Joel lamenting the fact that the once fruitful nation now spiritually bore no fruit at all. The branches were naked and stripped bare. Not unlike the religious leaders of Jesus' day, who now on this Tuesday morning were exactly 72 hours away from demanding that the Romans crucify their Messiah. We're talking about a fruitless fig tree. I can only wonder if a fig tree represented the United States of America, how much fruit would be on that tree today. Anyway, normally, the first of the figs, early fruit, Hosea called it, early fruit. Normally, the first of the figs would have appeared in February, before the leaves appeared in April. Now, what month, in what month, did this story happen? Happened in April, the time of Passover, correct? So normally... There should have been a bountiful crop of ripe figs because the coming of the leaves would have indicated that the leaves do not appear on the fruit until, or the leaves do not appear on the tree until the fruit is ripe. But on this Tuesday, Jesus came to this fig tree and according to Matthew, and I'm quoting him, found nothing on it but leaves. No fruit at all, which is a miracle in itself that the one tree they walked up to was the one fig tree in the land that had no fruit. Jesus seizing upon that as an object lesson. So Jesus said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. What would that have meant to the disciples? What would that have meant to the disciples? Let no fruit grow on you ever again. Again, the thing about God that scares me the most is given enough time, God will give us exactly what we want. What did that mean to the disciples when they heard that? Immediately, the fig tree withered away, Matthew writes, and when the disciples saw it, they marveled. They marveled because of the miracle that they found a tree, the first tree they approached, no fruit on it. They marveled because the fruit tree withered away and died right before their eyes. That was a miracle. And they marveled because of the symbolism and the significance of that. A symbolically devastating blow to be sure. Jesus just said that the nation would bear no more fruit. And he was absolutely right, as you will hear in just a second. Now imagine, for the disciples emotionally, the wild ride they had been on the last 24 to 48 hours. On Sunday, Jesus was welcomed into the city as a conquering hero, even though he rode into the city not on a horse, an animal of war, but he rode on a donkey, an animal of humility. And he rode into Jerusalem, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, on Passover lamb selection day but the disciples somehow were oblivious to all of that and thought that Jesus was indeed riding in as a hero, as did the people waving their palm branches. That was on Sunday. On Monday, Jesus single-handedly shut down the perversely corrupt money-making machine of the evangelical industrial complex temple style. And if you don't know what I mean by that, you ought to go with me sometime to a Christian conference and see. I sometimes wonder what Jesus would do when he walks in to gigantic rooms filled with booths, each booth filled with what I call Jesus junk. And I wonder if there wouldn't be a cleansing of all of that. Anyway, I digress. 
So he put these priests out of business, which caused this reaction as recorded by Mark, when the leading priests and teachers of religious law heard what Jesus had done to their temple operation, they began planning how to kill him. Now, you know from our study that they had talked many times before about how to kill him, but now it was how to kill him this week. And 72 hours later, they would succeed. And now Jesus sent the unmistakable message to his disciples that not only have his people become unfruitful yet again, as had happened during the time of the Assyrians, when the country was decimated in 722 B.C., and not only had it become unfruitful again, as it had when the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem in 586 B.C., but now Jesus proclaiming that curse on that tree, that was a prediction, a prophecy that would be fulfilled in A.D. 70 when the nation would be obliterated and cease to exist. And indeed, the nation of Israel was out of existence from A.D. 70, as you know, until the year 1948 when the nation rose like a phoenix out of the ashes. But that's another story. So the disciples had every reason to despair, just like you and me. So, just as he might say to us, Jesus quite pointedly said to them, don't despair. Don't give up. Trust me, in spite of how things are looking, I am in control. I am firmly in control. But he said that to them in a language, painting a picture that they would understand that you and I might not understand. Paint the picture, Rabbi. He painted for them a picture. But it is a picture that you and I may not understand not living there and not knowing the lay of the land. So let me try to bring out that picture to you in high definition. Let me read it to you again. Here's the picture, then I'll explain it. Jesus answered and said to them, assuredly, trust me, be sure of this. Okay? Don't lose heart. Don't lose hope. Assuredly, he said to them, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, But also if you say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer believing, you will receive. Now, that is not, with all due respect to 30 authors of 30 books where I stopped counting on Amazon, the titles of their books invoking the words faith, prayer, and mountain. That is not a blank check. Not by any stretch of the imagination. That entire promise hinges upon two very telling words, the key words of the passage, the words that unlock the meaning of the passage, and the two words are this mountain. If you say to this mountain, and it is not talking about a mountain of debt, a mountain of relationships, a mountain of marriage. It's not talking about those kinds of mountains. The mountain of sickness, Not at all. The point he was making, as I'll demonstrate in a moment, was this. But here's the point of the picture. Short term. In the short term, we will lose. In the long term, we will win. In the short term, disciples, you will lose. We will lose. They're going to kill me. In three days, the nation will cease to exist in about 40 years. In the short term, we lose. In the long term, we win. God's plans and purposes will not be frustrated and will not fail. They will succeed and we will win. Now, where do you get all of that out of this passage? Where in the world is that in the words that I read to you? Okay, listen to me. And I don't want to get too technical here. I'll make this very simple. But it's important you understand this. And it goes right to the heart of your own Bible study and how to understand the Bible for yourself. Those two words, this mountain. Hore tauto in the original. He was not talking abstractly nor metaphorically at all. A mountain of debt, a mountain of relationships, 
a mountain of marriage, a mountain of illness. He was not talking metaphorically at all. He was not talking about moving all the mountains in our lives. Not at all. He was not talking about whatever your mountain may be, that insurmountable, seemingly impossible challenge, the mountain of debt, unemployment, relationships, wayward kids, and if you just pray with enough faith, God will move that mountain. That is not what he meant. The word tauto in the original, and this is as technical as I will get, is a demonstrative pronoun, which means what in the grammar of the language? It is a word that is used to distinguish one object from every other object. To distinguish one object from every other object. In other words, when Jesus said, if you say to this mountain, he was isolating one mountain and separating it from every other mountain. He was pointing to a mountain. Now, there are some expositors, commentators, and perhaps even in your own study Bible, who will suggest that perhaps understanding what I just said to you, perhaps Jesus was referring to the Mount of Olives. Well, I can tell you assuredly he was not referring to the Mount of Olives. How do I know that? Because the Mount of Olives is not a standalone mountain. It is a mountain range that blends into another mountain range, Mount Scopus. It is a range, not a standalone mountain. So the question becomes, then to what mountain was Jesus referring? Well, let me take you to that road between Bethany and Jerusalem. And when you are on that road, there is one and only one mountain that dominates the skyline, that draws your eye to it. You cannot ignore it. It is there in your face. I will tell you about that mountain in a moment. But it is vital that you hear this in its context. Jesus knew that by the end of the week, the disciples would be in a state of despair. He knew that within 72 hours, by all appearances, Rome had won. He, Jesus, had lost. He'd be buried in three days and left to rot in a tomb. Of course, he rose from that tomb. But at the time of the crucifixion, the disciples, every one of them ran. They all scattered, and their faith completely collapsed, except for John, who stood at the foot of the cross until Jesus' dying breath. We'll get to that in a few weeks. Anyway, Jesus knew that he desperately and preemptively had to shore up their flagging faith. So he told them this in advance to shore up their faith. That is what this is all about. Otherwise, he knew that they would be totally swamped by the incredible events that would be happening in the next 72 hours. Okay, now listen. From where they were standing on the road that led from Bethany, where Jesus was staying, to Jerusalem, to where Jesus was traveling, there is only one mountain. It is ultra prominent. It is a standalone mountain and it dominates the skyline. Even today, your eye is drawn to it. You can't miss it. And as I picture in my mind what it looked like in Jesus' day, what I just said to you, overwhelmingly so. You couldn't miss it. Your eye would be drawn to it. It rises up out of the surrounding countryside like an intimidating cone. It actually looks like some ancient extinct volcano, but it is not a volcano, even though it looks like one. But it looks like a cone, this giant cone. One that inspires awe and wonder to us when we see it. But trust me, in Jesus' day, to the disciples, there was no awe or wonder attached to it at all. When they saw it, the disciples, it only caused them to feel a seething hatred in their hearts. Volcanic. No pun intended. And this wasn't a volcanic mountain. But the hatred they would have felt for their Roman overlords would have seethed in their guts like a raging volcano. And it's a hatred that I need you to feel. This mountain, as Jesus called it, is a mere seven miles from Jerusalem, four miles from Bethlehem, and it casts its shadow over the entire region and casts its shadow literally on the whole of redemptive history. When you stand at the top of that mountain, as I have, and look to the north, 
you can see Bethlehem right here and Jerusalem right here separated by about six inches. In one view, you see the whole of it, where Jesus was born, where Jesus died, was buried, and resurrected. In one panoramic view. From your thumb to your forefinger, you, that much separation between the two. It is that prominent a mountain. And by the time of Jesus, it had come to symbolize everything, everything that the Jews of Jesus' day hated about their Roman occupiers. The name of this mountain, it is called, listen for an echo now as I say this, it is called Herodium. Herodium. Do you hear an echo when I say that? Herod like Herod the Great, Herod, E-M, H-E-R-O-D-I-U-M, Herodium, Herod, the butcher of babies in Bethlehem. Of all of his lavish palaces slash fortresses, of which there were many, many, he always was in fear of somebody wanting to kill him, and he always wanted to be in close proximity to a fortress. The one that he especially feared was Cleopatra down in Egypt, and he wanted to be able at a moment's notice to flee to a fortress. He had them up and down the countryside. But of all of his fortresses, of all of his palaces, there is only one that Herod named after himself, Herodium. Only one. What is ironic about it is it doesn't get a whole lot of press. It would not surprise me at all if you had never heard of it before tonight. It's certainly not mentioned by name in the biblical accounts. Tour groups rarely go there. Rarely. In my 16 trips, I think I've been to Herodium three times. It's just not a place where anybody goes. And if you ask any of the people on those three tours where we did go to Herodium, what was the highlight of your study tour in Israel? None of them, none of them will say Herodium. I promise you. It has no claim to fame. It's not like Masada and that gripping dramatic story where 960 Jewish zealots committed mass suicide rather than bow the knee to Roman slavery. It is not like Herod's palace in Machaerus, which is infamous as the place where John the baptizer, our old friend, was imprisoned and eventually beheaded. It wasn't any of that. However, that being said, Herodium towered over the countryside like a perpetual prison guard monitoring your every move from afar. That's what Herodium did. And what a constantly intimidating stare that was, as if Herodium stood against the sky and against you with defiance. Herodium. I want you to imagine, if you can, in the middle of the Judean wilderness, a 40-acre compound, which is what Herodium was, dominated by a 300-foot-tall cone-shaped mountain rising menacingly out of the sun-blanched soil of that parched countryside. Take a football field and stand it on end. That's how tall the cone is. Now, add to the top of that cone a seven-story palace fortress that sat on top of that thing, no longer there, which goes to the heart of the story. I'll say more about that in a minute. But at the time it was seven stories tall, covered in dazzling white marble, gleaming in the sunlight as if it was on fire. And you put all of that together and Herodium stood nearly 2,600 feet above sea level, the highest peak in the Judean desert even today. Herodium. It's quite a place. How I wish I could take you there and point it out to you. Herodium is the single most spacious palace ever discovered in the entire Greco-Roman world of Jesus' Middle East. Did you hear that? Not just in Israel, 
but throughout the entire Middle East, Herodium, the most spacious palace ever discovered. A compound built by Roman slaves, the majority of whom were Jewish. Every square inch of it paid for by Jewish money, every shekel collected by turncoat Jewish tax collectors. Below that palace fortress, the largest swimming pool ever found in the Middle East. And understand, this is a swimming pool in the middle of the Judean wilderness. A pool that held a capacity, are you ready for this, 2,200,000 gallons of water. Diverted from Jerusalem to Herodium. A pool so big and so deep that Herod and his guests sailed boats across it, and in the middle of it was an island. You could sail out to the island with a domed canopy on top of the island. I can't put into words the lavishness of this thing. All of it augmented by lavish gardens and a huge colonnaded courtyard. Herodium. Halfway up the side of the hill, they discovered a one-half mile long, 100-foot wide walkway like a parade ground called the Course, the purpose of which I will tell you in a second. But think of that, a half mile long, 100-foot wide walkway. Why in the world would Herod build that halfway up this conical mountain? From the top of that walkway, you would climb 400 marble steps to get up to the palace. And when you finally reached the palace, it was replete with courtyards, hanging gardens, three cisterns that held a half million gallons of drinking water, bathhouses, balconies, a 1,700 square foot dining room. One room, 1,700 square feet. The palace itself was constructed in the shape of a circle, a double-walled cylinder, and the entire palace was 214 feet in diameter, with an entire network of rooms between the double walls that form the outside of that palace. And there were four massive towers, one on each of the four points of the compass, north, south, east, west. The largest of those towers was built on a stone base 60 feet in diameter, which is where Herod lived. And his rooms were decorated with mosaic floors and elaborate frescoes. The other three towers, which consisted of the guest rooms and storage areas, were 52 feet in diameter. In addition to all of that, Herod built a Roman theater with a VIP luxury box for him and his selected guests, and that towered over a seating capacity of 650 people in this thing. Why such grandeur, obscene as it was, and why in the world did he name it after himself? Here's why. He built it not only to be a palace, and he built it not only to be a fortress, he built it to be his own personal and private mausoleum. That's why he built it, to be buried there. And why that half mile long, 100 foot wide walkway halfway up the hill? He built that for his own funeral procession. I quote the famed Jewish historian Josephus. At the time of Herod the Great's death, quote, Herod's son Archelaus omitted nothing that could contribute to the magnificence of his father's final procession. He brought forth all of the royal ornaments to accompany the procession in honor of the deceased. The buyer was of solid gold studded with precious stones and had a covering of purple embroidered with various colors. On this lay the body, enveloped in a purple robe, a diadem encircling his head, and surmounted by a crown of gold, a scepter beside his right hand. Around the buyer, is that how you pronounce that? 
Buyer, I should know this. I work in the funeral business. B I E R. Is it buyer? Beer? Buyer? Okay. Around the, whatever it is, you know what I'm talking about. It's where you place the body. Around the buyer were Herod's sons and a large group of his relations. These were followed by the guards, the Thracian contingent, Germans and Gauls, all equipped as if for war. The remainder of the troops marched in front armed and in orderly array, led by their commanders and subordinate officers. Behind these came 500 of Herod's servants and freedmen carrying spices. The body was thus conveyed for a distance of 200 furlongs. That's 25 miles. The distance from Herod's palace in Jericho to Herodium. And indeed it was in Jericho where Herod the Great finally died where in accordance with the directions of the deceased, he was interred at Herodium. And then Josephus writes quite cryptically, so ended Herod's reign. Herodium. The famed Jewish archaeologist Ehud Netzer devoted his entire adult life to finding Herod's tomb. And he excavated at Herodium for 38 years. On May 8th of the year 2007, he finally, after 38 years, hit pay dirt and found Herod's tomb. Now the question that you might be asking, and it's appropriate, is this. How do I know that that is the mountain to which Jesus pointed and to which Jesus referred when he said, if you say to that mountain, this mountain, be cast into the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, when you read the word sea in the New Testament and there's no identification of a specific sea, you know they're talking about the Mediterranean, which encompasses the whole of the Roman Empire, if you think about it. How do I know that that's the mountain Herodium, this mountain to which Jesus referred? Jesus told his disciples that with enough faith, they could move this mountain. Yes? One last little factoid about this mountain. In addition to its location, in addition to its prominence, in addition to its disturbingly dominating the skyline, in addition to its symbolism, that volcanic cone-looking foundation that still stands today on which Herod's palace fortress was built and into which that cone, into the side of it, Herod the Great was buried. Are you listening? That volcanic cone was a man-moved mountain. When Herod came on the scene, there was no mountain there. Adjacent to it was a different mountain. But it wasn't tall enough or flat enough for his palace. Jesus said, if you have enough faith, you can move a mountain. I got news for you. You can move a mountain if you have enough slaves. <laughs> and bucket by bucket, they took down one mountain and erected another. It is a man moved mountain so much so that there were two identifying statements on the street that people would say in reference to Herod the Great two of them one of which I told you months ago when we talked about Herod the Great for the first time the word on the street was I would rather be Herod's pig than his son and I explained to you the significance of that. It's a play on words in the original. The Greek word for pig and the Greek word for son sound nearly the same. And because Herod pretended to be a Jew, he was not a Jew. He was an Idumean. But he wanted to pretend to be a Jew so he would never eat a pig. But he did kill his own son. So the word on the street was better to be Herod's pig than his son. The other designation on the street when people referred to Herod was this. Quote, a giant who moved a mountain. 
It defined him. Herod the Great, the killer of all the baby boys in Bethlehem, known throughout the Middle East as a giant who moved a mountain. So when Jesus said, assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to this fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, every disciple looking at Herodium, it draws your eye when you're on that road. And knowing that mountain had literally been moved, it will be done. And it was done. There isn't a Roman to be found in Israel today. The Roman Empire is gone. It is on the trash heap of human history, the Roman Empire. In fact, get this. Today, there is no Roman Empire. But today, there are multiplied millions of people like you and me around the world who would consider it our greatest and loftiest privilege to die if we needed to, to pay the ultimate sacrifice for Jesus. Multiplied millions of us. Herod's palace is in rubble. In rubble. The palace isn't even there anymore. It's just a pile of rocks. So it was as if Jesus said this to his disciples in a language they could understand. Yes, I cursed this fig tree. Yes, there are some dicey days coming for this land that you and I so love. And yes, the people of this land that you and I so love are in for some really difficult times. Yes, the nation as you know it will bear no more fruit. It won't even exist 40 years from now. Yes, by all outward appearances, it will look to you as if they win and we lose. They win, Jesus saying, and I lose. But understand, that's only in the short term. In the long term, fast forward to today, Israel rose from the dead. It is a thriving country. It is once again a lighthouse to the nations. God is very much involved today in the land of Israel. Today, Herod is nothing but an obliterated memory of history, the butcher of Bethlehem, whereas Jesus has followers the world over. And it would be as if Jesus said to us today, listen to us, talking to us in this backyard, listen to me. By all outward appearances, it may look like they win and we lose. But you've got to trust me, Jesus would say to us. I am bigger and I am infinitely more powerful than Donald Trump on his best day. That I know you know. What you may not know is this, Jesus speaking, I am bigger and infinitely more powerful than even Hillary on her best day. And in the end, in the end, neither Donald nor Hillary will win. In the end, Jesus will win. And when he wins, we win. And I would say to you, if you are ever tempted to doubt that, as I was this week, may I respectfully direct your attention. Google it if you have to, Herodium. Click on Images and gaze upon a now silent, totally abandoned pile of man-moved dirt. And you will know who wins. And it won't be them. I promise you. Thank you, Father, that as you once said, if these stones could speak, they would give praise to me. Jesus was right. And even today, a pile of rubble in the middle of the Judean wilderness. 
continues to speak. A message that I needed to hear this week. We might be in for some dicey days. It might become increasingly difficult for those of us who love and follow you. But that's okay. Because in the short term, even if they win, in the long term, they lose and you win. And when you win, we win. And for that assurance, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. And now, may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Thank you for listening to this Jesus in High Definition podcast. Could you do me a favor? If you found it to be a blessing, could you please spread the word? Share it on Facebook, email your contact list with a link to this podcast, let your friends know that we're here. I would greatly appreciate it. And while you're at it, check out my good friends at the e2medianetwork.com, e2medianetwork.com, for some compelling podcasts on a variety of subjects. I think you'll enjoy it. Join the conversation. Let us know what you think. Give us your feedback. We would love to hear from you.